welcome to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions webinar series. I'm Saul Katz. I serve on the Council's Board of Trustees. Following today's presentation, we'll have time to take questions from our listeners. At any point during the webinar, you may type questions into the box on the screen. Today's webinar, Ending Poverty, Practical Steps for Those Inspired by Their Faith, features Ms. Catherine Marshall. Catherine is a senior fellow at Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and visiting professor in the School of Foreign Service. She leads the Berkeley Center's work on faith-inspired institutions working in development that has involved both a regional mapping and exploration of priority development topics around the basic questions. What can we learn from faith-inspired work and why is it important for global development efforts? She is Executive Director of the World Faith Development Dialogue. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Saul. Good morning. Good morning. I'm absolutely delighted to have this chance to speak to what is one of the most important, if not the most important, issues that faces today's world, but which is also critical for success tomorrow. I'm going to start uh, by speaking to four headlines and then tell a personal story. Uh, the proposition of the whole presentation, however, is that while poverty was inevitable through most of human history and charity was the reasonable, caring response to the suffering that came with deprivation, hunger, uh, avoidable sickness, today poverty is not inevitable. It can be ended. But to do so, we need a new focus on topics like education and jobs more than simply charity. We need a new mindset that has human dignity, which is a fundamental ancient religious tradition that links all of the religions, human rights, and a will to human flourishing. Now, since we can end poverty, and we've seen it happen in Singapore, in many other parts of the world, we need to see it as our challenge and our obligation. We speak of a right to development, which is a spiritual covenant. But we also need to probe what that really means. And the central question today in this discussion is what can we do? And what steps do we need to take to make that happen? So the structure of the presentation is that I'm going to speak to these four headlines that I mentioned before and tell a personal story, then really ask, what does religion have to do with this? My answer includes what I call a moral ladder of answers. And then I want to focus on how important it is for all of us, from all religious traditions, from all secular traditions, to try to advance by focusing on the facts. And finally, I have some ideas which hopefully we'll explore during the question and answer uh, for action. So the first headline uh, is something we don't see very often, but it's a horrible reminder that each day we estimate that 20,000 people die because they are poor, because of poverty. It's complicated to make that estimate, and nowadays, we would no longer show this kind of a picture, which people describe as development pornography. But it is the uncomfortable fact that poverty is about suffering, but it is also about death. So this is the silent tsunami that we describe sometimes, because no one reports on mothers who die in childbirth, children who die of malaria, uh, not let alone the children who cannot go to school. The second headline, if I can see it, is just from yesterday. And it's an article from the Wall Street Journal. 
And it's speaking to the fact that there's a very large conference happening today in Washington on the world's newest nation, South Sudan. But the issue that's raised is that because of deficit concerns, U.S. foreign aid is under the microscope and Republicans in Congress have taken aim at the State Department's budget as a way to cut federal expenditures. Sadly, almost all of the candidates, when asked what they would cut, pick foreign assistance as the first victim. South Sudan is an excellent example of where there is enormous need, uh, need uh, in education, health, roads, it's a country with huge potential, independent only since July. It's the kind of place where an alliance of religions, governments, private business, foundations, and secular NGOs have a real chance to make a difference. And yet, this is one of the many areas that's under the gun on the chopping block in the current budget discussions. The third uh, headline is a very recent poll. It's a poll that was taken only in September, and it focused on the views of believers. And it came with a very hopeful message, showing that the very large majority of people who believe in God and who believe that there is a moral foundation for what we do said that they see a spiritual obligation to seek to reduce poverty and hunger. What that suggests is that these moral arguments are as important as the practical ones. For example, increased business or even security. And finally, there is great hope. Development efforts work. Sometimes that can be forgotten. But again, a story just today on the BBC is that global malaria deaths are falling. Just as a graphic example, it was only a few years ago that people would say that one child died of, from malaria every 30 seconds. Uh, then we talked about it every 45 seconds, and today it's a child every 60 seconds. Now, a child dying every 60 seconds is far too many. But the fact is that there is the makings of a dramatic success in a global campaign uh, to end malaria. My personal story goes back to a time when I was working on the Sahel region, one of the poorest regions in the world, uh, for the World Bank. And one of our priorities was education. So when I visited Niger, we visited a school. Uh, the children who were there were among the lucky ones because only 22 percent of children of school age had a chance then to go to school. The school we visited had more than a hundred children and they were sitting on the floor. There were no books. Uh, they were doing their best to learn and the teacher was doing the best to teach. But it was shall we say, a demanding and a sad situation. What made it even worse was that there was money available and there was a will, but many complicated political issues stood in the way. So it stands as a memory of need and of frustration. But it also stands as a memory of unfairness, because not long afterwards, within the week, I was visiting nursery schools in Washington, D.C where people were debating whether 14 children in a class was too many and whether or not computers should be used. So the core issue there is where is the justice? Why should a child's future be shaped by where they are born? Surely uh, in 2011, 2012, we can do better. So the next question is, what does religion have to do with this? Um, these uh, are not often considered as religious issues, and yet religion is fundamental, fundamentally involved in the global challenge of ending poverty. 
and a deeper appreciation of religion's role has the potential both to teach what works, to teach what does not, to reach far more people, particularly in the most remote areas, and to reach them with grounded, caring policies and programs that are anchored in the community. So bringing religion into this debate is essential and offers a fantastic potential uh, for expanding the results uh, that are involved in development. But bringing religion in and development, both of them are complicated. International development thinking has changed quite dramatically over the years. Uh, and these are, I've been working on it for about 40 years. And to me, these are some of the critical lessons. The first is that any sensible person will recognize the enormous increase in complexity. Our understanding is much deeper and hopefully much more humble. And there are more and more actors involved. There are lively debates on what works, why it works, what we need to do differently. And debate is healthy, unless it stymies action. There's much more discipline and thinking about results. If you dig a well, is it really going to provide water to the women of a community? Who is responsible? How does accountability work? How do we measure results? How do we move from ideas to implementation? And how do we fight corruption? Uh, we have tools and answers for all of these today, and they are the core of what we need to do. We need, and we know we need, to address the issues of fragmentation and aid coordination. And I will add here that this is one of the particular challenges for religious institutions and communities, which tend to prefer to work on their own outside of the context of development strategies. We know that we need global programs, but even more, we need country leadership and country ownership. And we know that we need to focus much more on the very poorest countries. Countries like Brazil, Thailand, China are doing remarkably well. But there are somewhere between 25 and 50 countries that are stuck at the bottom and where special efforts are needed. This picture is, I call it, a simplified diagram because, in fact, the real picture is vastly more complicated. But it is a portrayal of how the development community is working in one poor country. And what it conveys is why aid harmonization and aid coordination are so important. Can you imagine the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Health of that poor country trying to understand all of the boxes on the left, all of the oval circles, all of the complex lines. And remember that this is only a partial picture. Just for example, one of those oval circles is the entire United Nations system, which includes UNICEF uh, for children, WHO for health, and FAO for agriculture. So that is why one of the priorities today is to try to bring some kind of harmonization, some kind of focus into the development business. Can I see my next slide, please? The next slide, can we move to the next slide? Sorry, I've shut down my own slides because I can't see them there. So why is the link with religion so complicated? Uh, religion, as we all know, uh, is n one of the most complicated facets of the human condition. And we should never underestimate uh, how complex it is. Uh, and it's not about, it's not like water and engineering. It's not even like education, where evaluation of teachers is something that's readily measurable. Uh, the world of religion affects perhaps 6 billion of the world's 7 billion citizens in one way or another. 
Uh, and each uh, community, each tradition has its own approaches, its own notions of what human dignity and human flourishing mean. Uh, so in order for us to deal with this question of religion and development, we have to appreciate both the complexity of institutions, the hundreds and thousands of faith-inspired organizations, but we also need to recognize how far ethics and values are intertwined in the debates, the special sensitivities around what we mean by life, openness to life, what we mean by human dignity, what we mean by responsibility, and what we mean by rights. What makes it even more complex is that there are many preconceptions that people bring to any discussion of religion. Just to give you one example, for many people in the non-religious worlds, when they think of religion, they think proselytizing and evangelizing. Uh, they think uh, of complex concerns about motivations. They think about religion as a source of tension. They worry about how religions view the roles of women. What this means is that there are complex mutual suspicions that we need to overcome. These can be overcome in part through interfaith dialogue, the kind of work that the Parliament of Religions does, its core objective, its core uh, mission. It also means, though, that we need much more dialogue between the worlds of faith and the secular worlds. Uh, and in my experience, that dialogue can be more complicated, more sensitive than a dialogue with the world, within the worlds of religion, intra-faith or, for example, among Christian organizations. This is uh, a uh, portrayal by a South African cartoonist, Zapiro. Uh, that suggests these sensitivities around religion. He's portraying a religious minefield with the cartoonist, and we all know how sensitive cartoons can be tiptoeing among the heads of different religious leaders, uh, among different uh, religious authorities. Uh, but as we know, sometimes when you speak of religion and development, the whole focus comes on to abortion or comes on to the issues of gender. Uh, and those cannot be allowed to stop us from action and from the kind of dialogue that we need. So we need to work together, all of us, to address these global poverty challenges. We need to recognize that poverty is a scandal of our times, and it's a scandal because we can change it, because we can do something about it. In the past, when poverty was inevitable, an approach to charity that was uh, like a Band-Aid was very reasonable, but today we have a possibility and a challenge that we need to take into account. The United Nations, all of the nations who are members of the United Nations agreed at the turn of the millennium in the year 2000 on an extraordinary declaration, an inspirational declaration. and on Millennium Development Goals, eight of them, and specific quantified targets that represent both a moral commitment to the world's poor and a very practical architecture for dealing with them. So just as an example, two of those goals relate to having all children in primary school, and they also relate to ending diseases like HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. So my earlier note on the remarkable success in dealing with malaria is an example of a target where we, where we know we are making progress within the context of this global compact. Another feature of the Millennium Development Goals is that it has deadlines and a focus on accountability and measurement. So the deadline is the year 2015, which is less than four years off. So we know that action is urgent and needed. But I do want to inject here a note that simply ending the poverty that misery represents will never be enough. If we follow the 
what's happening, the exciting developments in the Middle East with what we call the Arab Spring. We need to note that it's not only misery we're talking about, but something we call equity, which is balance and fairness beyond poverty. Poverty is a challenge, something we can do something about, but inequality and inequity are much more complex challenges that we need to address as we move forward. When we talk about development, um, we bring out many arguments. Uh, many leaders will, will argue that it's in our own interests, that as Americans, for example, uh, we need absolutely uh, to uh, care about the people of Pakistan. We need to care about the people of Africa for our own sake. But I also want to note that I have had, in, in reflecting on this, to try to put these arguments into a moral ladder, uh, some kind of a, of a way of thinking about why we should care. And I have five rungs of this ladder that I'll touch on very quickly here. And again, we can discuss these during the question and answer. The most important reason for doing something about poverty is that it is the right thing to do. Uh, we should not allow children anywhere in the human family to suffer. Uh, women everywhere deserve our caring and our support. That means that it is about rights in the sense that we live in a globalized world and in a global village. There are some hitches in talking about the right to development. Uh, it can be fairly dry. People can be concerned about entitlement. But basically, we need to remember that that's why we should care about poverty, because it is the right thing to do. The traditional reasons for caring about the poor and the outcast, lepers, people with HIV AIDS, came under the heading of caring and compassion. And that was part of the ancient tradition in every religious community, to care about the poor, about orphans, about widows, to bring compassion and caring to the kind of work that we do. And that is essential. It's as essential today as it was a 1,000 years ago. The kind of impulse, the human impulse, that tugs at our hearts. There are some dangers in focusing purely on charity, however. And one of them is that it can be patronizing. It can mean that the person who has the money seems to be in a position of power vis-a-vis -vis the person, the refugee, living in a camp. And that's something that ancient wise people, as well as modern uh, wise people, have uh, can asked us to try to avoid. And I'll show you in a second a slide of Maimonides, an ancient Jewish leader who wrote in Arabic, who actually set out eight different levels of virtue in charity and in giving that basically starts from reluctant charity, giving only when you have to, all the way to the finest traditions of caring and giving, which essentially are anonymous and help the individual, the family, and the community to stand on its own feet. A third reason for caring, which is an important reason, uh, one that has both ethics but also very pragmatic side, uh, is that helping poor people to enter into the world system is good business. We talk about the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, the pyramid is a large pyramid with poor people at the bottom. And when those poor people, through microcredit, through entrepreneurship, through spiritual entrepreneurship, are able to be full citizens in the market sense of the word, uh, everyone benefits. Uh, we know that. Uh, there, we can sell them things. We can work with them. We can have a much more just, economically just world if we are able to reach the bottom of the pyramid. And movements of labor today, migration, are important and are likely to become more important. It's not something we can avoid. No human 
community can live forever in fortresses, nor do we wish to. And the final argument is that security is a part of poverty. Poverty and injustice contribute to anger, and they contribute to violence. So as a final area, if we want to be safe, we have to be willing to address these questions of poverty and inequity in the world. You will not be able to read the next slide, which is the eight points of Maimonides, but I have included them here simply to illustrate one fraction of the wisdom on poverty that we find in religious traditions. Uh, and the wisdom that lasts through the ages and the generations. So moving on towards facts and towards what we can do, uh, one area that is critically important, particularly, I think, in dealing with the emotional and complex issues around religion and religion's role in fighting poverty, is that we must try to improve our knowledge base because we are facing an enormous deficit both in knowledge and in understanding. One place to start is to understand how each religious tradition has thought about poverty and how that has changed, to try to draw both on ancient wisdom but also on the contemporary manifestations in the Sikh tradition, Catholic social teaching, uh, the evangelical traditions with their focus on action, on the Muslim traditions of sakat, uh, and on the strengths of Islamic finance, on Buddhist traditions, on Hindu, and so forth. We have an enormous variation among faiths and within faiths, and together they represent an extraordinary mine of experience and understanding. What is striking is that the work that each of these communities is doing has been very poorly mapped and understood, and there are large gaps in our simple understanding of who is doing what, where, with what resources, and why. And I would highlight here how important the situation of the poorest communities is in this. The countries we call conflict communities, where there is a special challenge, but also a special opportunity. The South Sudans, Burma, other countries like that offer us a particular challenge, but also an opportunity. And just to give an example of what we know and what we don't, we may know more about religion's role in global health than any other specific sector. We know that it is enormously important, but to give you an idea of what we don't know, the estimates of the contributions of religious communities to global health care range between 5% 5 and 70%, 5 and 70, which is a graphic illustration of the weakness of our knowledge. So knowledge is a critical, critical factor. The next slide is an illustration of the issues of knowledge and why they matter. There are many polls that have asked American citizens, we're talking about American citizens now, a set of questions. The first one is, how much do you, of the federal budget do you think goes for foreign aid? What do you think is appropriate? And then, of course, the answer. What is the percentage? What is extraordinary is that in polls taken for the last 20 or 30 years, there's an answer that is somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of what people think the federal budget spends on development assistance, on poverty, international poverty. And when people are asked what is the right percentage, it's very close to 10 percent. But the reality is that just 1% of the budget goes to foreign aid. What is disheartening here is that this question has been asked year after year, and yet the answers seem to be stuck at the same level. So this is an illustration 
of what we can all do in churches, mosques, communities, schools, and universities to try to start with a sounder foundation of understanding. Next. Another area that is important on knowledge is that we need to understand much better through case studies and example what actually works. And we need to be willing to address some of the tough issues. One of the toughest issues is gender. It is a tough issue because it involves perceptions. And as we all know, perceptions, whether they are true or false, matter. So one of the first images of religions is that they are patriarchal and that women are at the bottom, uh, that religions do not support equality for women. So that is an example of an issue where the complexity of the real situation needs to be addressed. Another area is on governance and corruption. Uh, governance is a critical part of the traditions today, and we need to move. A specific example is what is the best way to care for orphans. GMOs are genetically modified organisms. Religions are an important part in a global debate about what is safe and what is wise in genetically modified uh, organisms. What can religious traditions do in disaster relief? And how can we approach that sensitive, the most sensitive issue of all, reproductive health, child spacing, and family planning? Next. I want to finish with the next after. So this is a cartoon about the GMOs. The next picture is of Aceh following the tsunami, where the only building left standing was the mosque, uh, an illustration of how important uh, the, and how solid, in a sense, it's a metaphor for the strength of religious institutions and traditions. So the final slide I want to speak to quickly is some areas for action. Let's move to the last slide, please. Six practical steps. First, citizens can support intelligent development and engage in our political process so that foreign assistance is not the first to be cut, the caboose in terms of priorities. We can encourage much more learning about development, about the world, in school curricula, universities, churches, communities, reaching out across faiths and through interfaith work. We can all of us support worthy institutions with our volunteerism and with our financial support. And we can support systems as well as individuals. And we can be involved in the dialogue and the debate about the sensitive issues that I highlighted before. And I think we all know that once we've seen and had the experience of working with people in other parts of the world, we realize that we are all human beings and that simple justice and right suggests that we need to see the challenge of poverty as a common critical uh, challenge for us all. Thank you. Um, look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today for this uh, talk with Catherine Marshall. I believe it was a brilliant and uh, a challenging uh, presentation that all of us, uh, I'm sure, will have questions about it. Uh, and uh, but before I go on, I just want to um, uh, to invite you to join with us for our next uh, webinar with Ronit uh, Avni, an award-winning filmmaker and human rights advocate and media strategist um, uh, with an expertise in Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolutions. Uh, I'll come back to that in a, in a few moments, but I wanted to uh, first ask you also that we do have time for questions from our listeners and what I'd like you to do is to type your questions into the box on your screen. Uh, some of these questions have already come in and I'd like to, uh, uh, in, to go over a few of those with you. Um, one question uh, from India uh, from one of our listeners is uh, what advice uh, do you have for groups at the neighborhood level who want to work on issues of poverty locally and interreligiously? 
Catherine, would you like to address that question? In some senses, the most important priority for long-term development is education. Uh, and education is something that affects every family and every community. So working with the school system, working with early childhood education, uh, is something that every one of us has the opportunity to do, whether we're in Calcutta or whether we're in Jakarta or Singapore. So I think that that's a first critical step. The second is to try both to engage with people who are suffering, but also at the same time to dig into the causes of suffering. I think we all have this sense that when there is a disaster, our hearts are moved and we want to help. We want to do something. We want to be engaged. And so after a tsunami or the Haiti earthquake, Katrina, there's an outpouring of support. But then there is this sense of unease that we, we need to find a way to prevent Katrina's, to prevent uh, the kind of situation in Haiti from happening again. And that's a thinking process disaster preparedness, but also root causes that we can look at in the context of every community, uh, wherever we live in the world. Very interesting uh, perspectives. Thank you uh, f on behalf of that uh, questioner. Uh, another question um, has, uh, is a, a very interesting question is raised from Chicago. What is, uh, and the question is, what is the role of global and local corporations and businesses in eradicating poverty. For example, Exxon Mobil, Mobil gives significantly to dealing with malaria in Africa and elsewhere. Do you have any special um, comment you'd like to make about the role the business could play with respect to the questions that you've been raising? When I talk about the new kinds of partnerships that we're we're dreaming of and that are we're seeing taking shape in many parts of the world. Clearly business is a key player in this. Um, business brings the entrepreneurial uh, skills, uh, the disciplines of hopefully beyond the simple profit motive, uh, the, the disciplines of excellence, uh, the disciplines of doing the best you can with whatever resources you have of managing resources efficiently. Those are some of the gifts that business brings and that we see reflected, for example, in the Millennium Development Goals. What we're also seeing is um, an explosion of interest in corporate social responsibility. Uh, it can range from simply a couple of gifts for, uh, for uh, a museum in the community to the kind of roles uh, that to some very large companies, uh, ExxonMobil is an example, that they're playing in the development of communities because any wise company uh, realizes that it's not only their reputation that's at stake, but that they cannot be successful in business without uh, dealing with the health of the society. Oh, so what we see today is an, is an extraordinary range of exciting initiatives and programs. I don't think we have any idea what percentage of companies have truly shifted their thinking from a pure single bottom line of financial profitability to a minimum of a, of a triple bottom line, which we call the social sustainability, financial sustainability, and environmental sustainability. My suspicion is that we have really quite a long way to go, but the potential of companies to be part of this global compact, this moral covenant, I think is absolutely enormous and we've barely begun to scratch it. Um, uh, two questions came in and I'm going to sort of combine them uh, purposefully here because one from Nigeria asks, are there examples of serious efforts to end poverty in Africa? And then another one asking a question on Africa, and that one is, is it ethical for those of us who are working to create social entrepreneurs in Africa to ignore government and work independently in the hope that the government will change? So there are two well, questions those are here. Two, 
all of these are fascinating questions, and I thank you for them. Let me start. I've spent most of my career working on Africa, and in some sense I have a love affair with Africa. I am deeply committed uh, and care uh, about Africa every, every single day. Um, one of the tragedies uh, of Africa is the Afro-pessimism which has seized so many people. And there are wise Africans and wise friends of Africa who are trying to convey a different message. And that message is that Africa is on the move, that Africa has extraordinary successes. It's the fastest growing region in the world today. And in each and every country, there are examples of what can be done, of successes, uh, of creative efforts uh, to change uh, the the situation, so so Africa has it has plenty of problems, and the the cloud uh, of negativism does have, of course, some reasons. But there are an extraordinary range of hopeful developments in the country in all of the 48, 49 countries uh, that are that are part of of Africa. Um, the second question is is a fascinating one, um, because and it does speak not only to entrepreneurs but also to religious traditions. And what it speaks to is a general cynicism about government and about what government can do, and therefore an inclination to do whatever is possible to work around governments. Now, once again, there are plenty of reasons for being discouraged about governance and about governments. On the other hand, we should never forget uh, that without law and order, without a functioning state, without good governance, no society can really succeed in the long term. So what is needed is a thoughtful and a sensible, but also a proactive, aggressive approach everywhere both to improving the quality of governance, but also to defining what governments can and should do and what should be left to uh, private actors. How can you build partnerships? Just as an example, in the South Sudan, the brand new country, most of the schools and most of the health systems, but also most of the agricultural extension work that exists today is being provided by religious organizations. There are many companies that want to come in and that want to be engaged in the Sudan, South Sudan. Uh, but there's also a brand new government that has extraordinary capacity challenges, very few civil servants. So what makes sense in that situation? It doesn't make sense, I don't think, for entrepreneurs to come in and to ignore the government, uh, to work outside it. Uh, what makes sense is to try to have an adult conversation, uh, an effective discussion of who can do what most effectively, uh, how they can do it, and how they can work together within the framework of some kind of a strategic plan, a strategic vision of where that society in that country wants to go. That simply is taking uh, the South Sudan, the newest country, as one example. But you could say much the same thing about Nigeria, one of the largest countries, about Gambia, tiny country, uh, about Niger, Mali, about Malawi. So all of these countries cannot, we cannot allow the cynicism about government and about the public sector to drown out the need uh, for that in providing a decent regulatory system and providing the most essential services that citizens everywhere have a right to expect. Um, here's another uh, uh, question that uh, has, has uh, come up, uh, and I wanted to uh, get your sense of this. Um, this is one uh, that involves um, uh, governments uh, here, and, and this comes from North Carolina, uh, in the, here in the United States, that is. Uh, what role do governments play, and particularly the U.S. government, in the eradication of poverty? It's a big question, but maybe you want to focus on some piece of that. 
<laughs> yes, you're right. It's a very large and a very important question. At the moment, it's, it's a very complicated one, too, because the, I think the most recent estimate is that there are 22 federal government departments that are involved in delivering aid programs of some kind, and many state governments and even cities uh, and local communities and churches are also part of the American uh, efforts to, uh, to work on poverty uh, and on development. I think it's useful to remember that there are at least three major parts of the way that the U.S. government uh, in, is involved in, in this poverty challenge. The first one is the foreign aid. In other words, actual programs where U.S. tax dollars go to support school development in a country, or they go to support agricultural research, or they go for HIV AIDS uh, programs. They, those, are, those are sort of the direct foreign assistance. The second um, is policies. And the policies that get the most focus are US trade policies. In other words, are our policies encouraging countries in other parts of the world to invest so that they can export, including to the United States? Uh, are we encouraging the flow of trade that is one of the backbones of globalization in its best sense. Uh, an example of a policy which is uh, very much a concern to many people is agricultural subsidies. Uh, so for example, U.S. cotton farmers receive subsidies and that can hurt farmers in Mali and in Burkina Faso because it means that the prices they receive will be much lower and they may find direct obstacles um, to their exports. So the, um, the, uh, the policies on trade, policies on investment, policies uh, in many different areas are, are critically important. The third area that, that I think we, we really need to return to often is education. One of the strengths, one of the extraordinary strengths, and one that is respected all over the world of the United States is our education system and our research capacity, our capacity for innovation, uh, for creativity, uh, for uh, in so many different sectors. Um, foreign students coming to the United States is, is a very important part of the way that the United States uh, has over many years helped to develop uh, countries. Uh, the support that our universities, my own university, Georgetown University, for example, has a campus in uh, Doha, in Qatar, uh, which is helping to train some of the future uh, foreign policy specialists uh, in the Middle East. And that kind of intervention is very important. Uh, it's also important that we re really focus on our own schools to make sure that we raise citizens who are literate in world affairs, including the world's religions, uh, including the importance of the interconnections in our globalized world, so that they understand that they cannot live in any community without taking into account the needs of other people, even in far corners of the world. So I think these three areas, the direct foreign assistance, the, uh, the um, policy environment, which affects both public and private uh, actors, uh, religious and secular, and the hub role of education in thinking about the future of the world. That's very interesting uh, response. I appreciate that enormously because I think that those are such critically important areas that you've touched upon there. I'd like to um, suggest that there are a few other questions, uh, and I would hope to be able to get to all of these. And so I'm going to ask a first question. Uh, is um, Here you are addressing the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions, and so the question I have is, how can the problem of the world's religion become a constructive catalyst for more coordinated action among the religious communities, donor NGOs, that are helping to relieve poverty in third world countries? 
Coordination is one of the most complicated problems that we face in the development world, and that's why I showed you the spaghetti chart, which gives you an impression of the near impossibility of understanding all of the different actors that are involved in development. Uh, what I didn't highlight is that the most uncoordinated of the many actors, foundations, private sector, NGOs, governments, uh, UN organizations, by far I think the most uncoordinated and the ones with the least systematic knowledge are those involved with different world religions. Uh, and so this uh, coordination challenge is a very real and a very central one. Uh, it's not simply a question of somebody telling everyone what to do. It's a question of drawing on the experience of these religious bodies uh, and having them have a seat at the table. Uh, one comment that resonates with many people is this uh, challenge that if you're not at the table, you end up on the menu. And the question here is that these bodies, the religious bodies, for example, really need to be part of the discussions of policy that are shaping uh, policies towards the, towards the international world. Uh, they should be part of the discussions about agricultural research, drawing on their experience. They need to be part of discussions about health and education, uh, about trade. Uh, but with so many different religious traditions, many people have simply thrown their hands up in despair in thinking about the coordination issue. And I think here the parliament can be very helpful. Uh, the parliament and the other interfaith groups, they can, first of all, I think make these challenges more real for the religious leaders and communities. Um, make them move up the priorities. In a sense, the parliament started with a history of dealing with peace issues, which is of course critical, of dealing with understanding and social tensions. But I think we need to understand that unless there is education and jobs, uh, no matter how much interfaith dialogue takes place about beliefs and about practices, uh, about the richness of traditions, but without jobs and education and decent health care, we will not have a peaceful world. And so the parliament, I think, can help to make this an integral part of the understanding of discussions of interfaith action. I think the parliament also can help in what I pointed out as an enormously complex and difficult challenge, which is trying to bridge the gulfs not only among religious traditions, but between those and some of the secular institutions like UN agencies and bilateral aid. And finally, I think the parliament can help in this knowledge challenge of helping us to understand better what different religions, traditions are doing, but also in helping to have a dialogue about those tough issues. And I mean tough issues as tough as abortion, uh, as tough as gender roles, uh, as tough as GMOs. Uh, these are issues where the religious traditions, these are ethical, moral issues. They're about fundamental issues of people's lives. And to me, that's the business of interfaith organizations like the parliament, to try to find ways to have a moral, an ethical, but also a, an honest and a probing discussion so that we can make, make progress. Just to give you an example, I think one exciting issue where the religious traditions could unite is on ending child marriage. Uh, a lot of maternal mortality is because very young girls are married, often probably generally against their will. Uh, and children as young as 10 and 11 are being married. Oh, to me, this is an issue where religious leaders are clearly involved because they're influential in the culture, but they're also, they're the ones who do the marriages. So if this could become a cause to end child marriage, for an organization like the parliament, uh, getting every girl to go to school. Uh, these are issues where uh, an advocacy and a mobilization on moral and ethical grounds, on the shared, shared values, the shared real values, the true values of all of the faith traditions could really make a difference.
Well, that's uh, very fascinating as a challenge to all of us who are listening. Um, I'm going to read two other questions. I know we will not have enough time to answer them, but I think in, to give them justice, I, I want to make sure that they're heard. Uh, one is from Missouri. How can young adults become more involved in these efforts, and how can communities be more welcoming of the contributions of young adults? I'll read the other uh, as well. Uh, can you speak more about the moral ladder, and what else do you, did you hope to share about that? Uh, and, uh, and these are a couple of the other questions uh, that came in, and I thought it would be helpful, including another one on what would be your definition of economic peace. Now, I know all of these questions are more than you can possibly address, but you might want to say uh, about one or two closing words, and then I'm going to uh, uh, close our session with a uh, statement uh, of thanks to everyone. So um, if you want to comment very briefly, just for a moment, that would be great. Very briefly, um, focusing on mobilizing the energies and the optimism and hope of young people is absolutely uh, vital, and it's an area where, where we can move. It's also an area of hope, because the polling data often shows that young people care more about environment and about poverty than the older generations. So I think we can end on that as a, as a, a lesson of hope. Thank you so much for joining us today for this talk with Catherine Marshall. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for all of you who are participating. I just want to remind thank you again. You all, thank you all. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, please join us for our next webinar. If I, I mentioned before, with Ronit Avni, an award-winning filmmaker, human rights advocate, and media strategist with an expertise in Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolution efforts. We also invite you to stay connected to the interreligious movement through our email newsletter and by visiting our social network at peacenext.org. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on our website within the next few days. If you'd like to review it or share it with others, please do so, given what we've heard tonight. I want to say that the Council for the Problem of the World's Religion is also a 501c3 nonprofit charitable institution that needs the continuing support of its constituents to provide the kind of program like this one today. Uh, and so in this season of giving, I hope you'll please consider the problem as a part of your annual giving plans. The vision of the, the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions is of a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. We work to cultivate harmony among the world's religions, religious and spiritual communities and to foster their engagement with the world and its guiding institutions. For years, the Council has creatively and concretely worked to link the interreligious movement from the local to the global, and we send our thanks to all of you who are doing your part for a better world. And once again, on behalf of the Council, thank you again for joining us today. Good night, good afternoon, and good day.